Good morning, everybody. We are ready to continue on in our reading of Farmer Boy. We finished chapter four, surprise, yesterday, and we are going to continue on with chapter five today, which is called Birthday. As we ended our story yesterday, um, Big Bill Ritchie had just been put in his place by Mr. Course, the very small, thin, quiet, soft-spoken school teacher. And he did it without actually hurting him. He taught him that he needed to respect his teachers without actually physically harming him. The chapter we're reading today, if you're following along in the physical copy, it starts on page 49. If you're following along in the PDF, the title is Birthday. Next morning, while Almanzo was eating his oatmeal, father said that it was his birthday. Almanzo had forgotten it. He was nine years old that cold winter morning. There's something for you in the woodshed, father said. Elmanzo wanted to see it right away, but mother said if he did not eat his breakfast, he was sick and he must take medicine. Then he ate as fast as he could, and she said, don't take such big mouthfuls. Well, there's always fuss about the way you eat. You can hardly eat any way that pleases them. But at last, breakfast was over, and Elmanzo got to the woodshed. There was a little calf yoke, one of our spelling words. Father had made it of red cedar, so it was strong and yet light. It was Elmanzo's very own, and father said, yes, son, you are old enough now to break calves. Elmanzo did not go to school that day. He did not have to go to school when there were more important things to do. He carried a little yoke to the barn, and father went with him. Elmanzo thought if he handed the calves perfectly, perhaps father might let him help with the colts next year. Star and Bright were in their warm stall in the south barn. Their little red sides were sleek and silky from all the currings that Almanzo had given them. They crowded against him when he went into the stall, and they licked at him with their wet, wet, rough tongues. They thought he had brought them carrots. They did not know he was going to teach them how to behave like big oxen. Father showed him how to fit the yoke carefully to their soft necks. He must scrape its inside curves with a bit of broken glass till the yoke fitted perfectly and the wood was silky smooth. Then Elmanzo let down the bars of the stall, and the wandering calves followed him into the dazzling, cold, snowy bone barnyard. Father held up one end of the yoke while Elmanzo led the other, laid the other end on Bright's neck. Then Elmanzo lifted up the bow under Bright's throat and pushed its ends through the holes made for them in the yoke. He slipped a wooden bow, bow pen through one end of the bow above the yoke and held the bow in place. Bright kept twisting his head, trying to see this strange thing on his neck. But Almanzo had made him so gentle that he stood quietly, and Almanzo gave him a piece of carrot. Star heard him crunching it and came to get his share. Father pushed him around beside Bright until the other end of the yoke and Almanzo pushed up the other bow under his throat and fastened it with the bow pin. There already he had his little yoke of oxen. Then father tied a rope around Star's nubs of horns, and Almanzo took the rope. He stood in front of the calves, and he shouted, Giddy up! Star's neck stretched out longer and longer. Almanzo pulled, till finally Star stepped forward. Bright snorted and pulled back. The yoke twisted Star's head around and stopped him, and the two calves stood wondering what it was all about. Father helped Almanzo push them till they were stood properly side by side again. And then he said, well, son, I'll leave you to figure it out. And he went into the barn. Then Almanzo knew that he really was old enough to do important things all by himself. He stood in the snow and he looked at the calves and they stared innocently at him. He wondered how to teach them what giddy up meant. There wasn't any way to tell them, but he must find some way. When I say giddy up, you must walk straight ahead. Elmanzo thought a while, and then he left the calves and went to the cow's feed box and filled his pockets with carrots. He came back and he stood as far in front of the calves as he could, holding the rope in his left hand. He put his right hand into the pocket of his barn jumper, and then he shouted, giddy up, and he showed Star and Bright a carrot in his hand. They came eagerly. Whoa, Elmanzo shouted when they reached him, and they stopped for the carrot. He gave each of them a piece, and when they had eaten it, he backed away again. Putting his hand in his pocket, he shouted, Giddy up! 
It was astonishing how quickly they learned that giddy up meant start forward and woe meant to stop. They were behaving as well as grown up oxen when father came to the barn door and said, that's enough, son. Almanzo didn't think it was enough, but of course he could not contradict father. Calves will get sullen and stop minding if you work them too long at first, father said. Besides, it's dinner time. Almanzo could hardly believe it. The whole morning had gone in a minute. He took out the bow pin bow pins, let the bows down, and lifted the yoke off the calf's neck. He put star and bright in their warm stall. Then father showed him how to wipe the bows and yoke with wisps of clean hay and hang them on their pegs. He must always clean them and keep them dry, or the calves would have sore necks. In the horse barn, he stopped just a minute to look at the colts. He liked star and bright, but calves were clumsy and awkward compared with the slender, fine, quick colts. Their nostrils fluttered when they breathed, their ears moved as swiftly as birds, and they tossed their heads with a flutter of manes and daintily pawed with their slender legs and little hooves, and their eyes were full of spirit. It's a man's job, son, father said. One little mistake will ruin a fine colt. Almanzo did not say any more. He went soberly into the house. It was strange to be eating all alone with father and mother. They ate at the table in the kitchen because there was no company today. The kitchen was bright with the glitter of snow outside. The floor and the tables were scrubbed bone white with lye and sand. The tin saucepan glittered silver and the copper pots gleamed gold on the walls. The tea kettle hummed, hum, hummed and the geraniums on the window were redder than mother's red dress. Almanzo was very hungry. He ate in silence, busily filling his big emptiness inside him while father and mother talked. When they finished eating, Mother jumped up and began putting the dishes into the dishpan. You fill the wood box, Almanzo, she said, and then there's other things you can do. Almanzo opened the woodshed door by the stove, and there, right before him, was a new ham sled. He could hardly believe it was for him. The calf yoke was his birthday present. He asked, whose sled is that, Father? Is it? It, it, it isn't for me. Mother laughed and father twinkled his eyes and asked, do you know any other nine-year-old that wants it? It was a beautiful sled. Father had made it of hickory. It was long and slim and swift looking. The hickory runners had been soaked and bent into long, clean curves that seemed ready to fly. Almanzo stroked the shiny, smooth wood. It was polished so perfectly that he could not even feel the tops of the wooden pegs that held it together. There was a bar between the runners for his feet. Get along with you, Mother said, laughing. Take that sled outdoors where it belongs. The cold stood steady at 40 below zero, but the sun was shining, and all afternoon Almanzo played with his sled. Of course, it would not slide in the soft, deep snow, but in the road, in the, bob, the bobsled's runners had made two sleek, hard tracks. At the top of the hill, Almanzo started the sled and flung himself on it, and away he went. Only the track was curving and narrow. So sooner or later, he spilled into the drifts. End over end went the flying sled, and headlong went Almanzo, but he floundered out and climbed the hill again. Several times he went into the house for apples and donuts and cookies. Downstairs was still warm and empty. Upstairs, there was a thud, thud of mother's loom and the clickety-clack of the flying shuttle. Almanzo opened the woodshed door and heard the slithery soft sound of a shaving knife and the flap of a turned shingle. He climbed the stairs to father's attic workroom. His snowy mittens hung by their string around his neck. In his right hand, he held a donut, and in his left hand, two cookies. He took a bite of the donut and then a bite of cookie. Father sat astraddle of the end of the shaving bench by the window. The bench slanted upwards toward him, and at the top of the slant, two pegs stood up. At his right hand was a pile of rough shingles, which he had split with his axe from short lengths of oak logs. He picked up a shingle laid its end against the pegs, and then drew the shaving knife up on its side. One stroke smoothed it, and another stroke shaved the upper end thinner than the lower end. Father flipped the shingle over. Two strokes on that side, and it was done. Father laid, on the, laid it on the pile of finished shingles and set another rough one against the pegs. His hands moved smoothly and quickly. They did not even stop when he looked up and twinkled at Almanzo. Be ye having a good time, son, he asked. Father, can I do that? asked Almanzo. Father slid back on the bench to make room in front of him for Almanzo. I'm going to show you this picture before I turn. That's the bench that he's working on. 
Almanzo straddled it and crammed the rest of the donut into his mouth. He took the handles of the long knife in his hands and shaved carefully up the shingle. It wasn't as easy as it looked. So father put his big hands over Almanzo's and together they shaved the shingles smooth. Then Almanzo turned it over and they shaved the other side. That was all he wanted to do. He got off the bench and he went in to see mother. Her hands were flying and her right foot was tapping on the treadle of the loom. Back and forth, the shuttle flew from her right hand to her left and back again between the even threads of the wrap. Swiftly, the threads of the wrap crisscrossed each other, catching fast the thread that the shuttle left behind. Thud, said the treadle. Clackety-clack, said the shuttle. Thub, said the handbar, and back through the th flew the shuttle. Mother's workroom was large and bright and warm from the heating stove's chimney. Mother's little rocking chair was by one window, and beside it a basket of carpet rags toned for so torn for sewing. In a corner stood the idle spinning wheel. All along one wall were shelves full of hanks of red and brown and yellow and blue yarn, which mother had dyed last summer. But the cloth on the loom was sheep's gray. Mother was weaving undyed wool from a white sheep and the wool from a black sheep twisted together. What's that for? asked Almanzo. Don't point, Almanzo, said mother. That's not good manners. She spoke loudly above the noise of the loom. This is the picture of the loom that she's working on. Who is it for? asked Almanzo, not pointing this time. Royal, it's his academy suit, said Mother. Royal was going to the academy in Malone next winter, and Mother was weaving the cloth for his new suit. So everything was snug and comfortable in the house, and Almanzo went downstairs and took two more donuts from the donut jar, and then he played outdoors again with his sled. Too soon, the shadows slanted down the eastward slopes, and he had to put his sled away and help water the stock, for it was chore time. This was, the well was quite a long way from the barn. A little house stood over the pump, and the water ran down a trough through the well and into the big watering trough outside. The troughs were coated with ice and the pump handle was so cold that it burned like fire if you touched it with a bare finger. Boys sometimes dared other boys to lick a pump handle in the cold weather. Almanzo knew better than to take that dare. Your tongue would freeze to the iron and you must either starve to death or pull it away and leave part of your tongue there. Almanzo stood in the icy pump house and he pumped with all of his might while father led the horses to the trough outside. First father led out the teams with the young colts following their mothers. Then he led out the older colts one at a time. They were not yet well broken and they pranced and they jumped and they jerked at the halter rope because of the cold. But father hung on and did not let them get away. All the time, Elmanzo was pumping as fast as he could. The water gushed from the pump with a chilly sound and the horses thrust their shivering noses into it and drank it up quickly. Then father took the pump handle he pumped the big trough full and he went to the barns and turned out all of the cattle. Cattle did not have to be led to water. They came eagerly to the trough and drank while Almanzo pumped and then they hurried back to the warm barns and each to his own place. Each cow turned into her own stall and put her head between her own sanctions. They never made a mistake. Whether this was because they had more sense than horses or because they had so little sense that, that they did everything by habit, father did not know. Now Almanzo took the pitchfork and began to clean the stalls while father measured oats and peas into feed boxes. Royal came from school and they all finished the chores together as usual. Almanzo's birthday was over. He thought he must go to school the next day. But that night, father said it was time to cut ice. Almanzo could stay home to help and so could Royal. So now um, Almanzo's pretty excited because he gets another day off of school. He didn't actually go to school that day because it was his birthday. Hmm, that's kind of interesting, right? Why do you think Almanzo says he feels old enough to do important things by himself now? Yes, because. He's nine years old, for one thing, and he was he's working with his calves, and he's been working with them all morning long. Why do you think that father stops helping Elmanzo and goes into the barn? Yeah, he wants Elmanzo to figure out himself 
how to get those horses to um, understand giddy up and whoa. He wants Almanzo to do it. He wants him to learn. Explain how does El Almanzo teach his star and bright to understand giddy up and whoa? What does he do that teaches him that? Yeah, he, he uses carrots and he steps back and he holds out a carrot and he says, giddy up. And then they come and then he says, whoa, and he feeds them the carrot. And then he does the same thing. He steps back again, holds out the carrot and does the same thing over and over and over until they learn giddy up and whoa. He worked with them all morning to teach them that. While Almanza was watching Mother work, she tells him she is making a suit for Royal that he's going to need next winter. Why do you think it's going to take her so long to make the suit? Well, first she has to make the material. Yes, she has to weave it together. She has white wool. She has black wool. And she's weaving them together on her loom. So that, that's making like a gray cloth. And then once she has the cloth, then she has to cut it and make it into a suit. How is El Mongo's birthday the same as yours? How is it different from yours? Well, you don't get to skip school for one thing, right? <laughs> That's one way that it's very different. Okay, let's go ahead and take some notes in our interactive notebook. Today's date is 2-25-26. Write your name, the date, 2-25-21. <laughs> Wrong year. And it's lesson five. Chapter five is where we are. All right. The first one is yoke. One of our spelling words, yoke. A crossbar with two U-shaped pieces that encircle the necks of a pair of animals working together. Say it. A crossbar with two U-shaped pieces that encircle the necks of a pair of animals working together. Say it. A crossbar with two U-shaped pieces that encircle the necks of the pair of animals working together. Say it as you're writing it down. A crossbar with two U-shaped, and that's a hyphenated word, U-shaped pieces that encircle the necks of a pair of animals working together. Okay. The next definition is break the calves. We're going to put break, B-R-E-A-K, into quotation mark. He's going to break the calves. To train to obey. To tame. Say it. To train to obey. To tame. Say it. To train to obey. To tame. To train, to obey. Then we're going to use a semicolon to tame. All right. The next word is shingle. A thin, oblong piece of material, such as wood, laid in overlapping rows to cover the roof of a building. Say it. Did you remember it? A thin oblong piece of material, such as wood, laid in overwrapping rows to cover the roof of a building. Say it. A thin oblong piece of material, such as wood, laid in overlapping rows to cover the roof of a building. Say it as you're writing it down. A thin 
oblong piece of material. He had wood, father did, comma, such as wood. comma, laid in overlapping rows to cover the roof of a, to cover the roof of a building. All right. The next one is treadle. We're going to use e -a, a tread o. It ends in final silent e. Job number four. Every syllable must have a written vowel. Treadle. A, a pedal or lever operated by the foot. Say it. A pedal or lever operated by the foot. Say it. A pedal or lever operated by the foot. Say it as you're writing it down. A pedal or lever operated by the foot. Okay, if you are following along in the copy of the book that is in Bright Thinker, um, uh, you're going to have to figure out somehow to get it open. I am going to read you the, the paragraph that we're going to copy. We are going to copy an entire paragraph. If you're following along in the book, it's on page 50. That's what we're going to write in cursive today. And it is the paragraph part way down, about two thirds of the way down, that starts with Elmanzo did not go to school that day. Let's go ahead and write that down. Elmanzo did not go to school that day. Remember, your blocks are stacked. Both of your feet are on the ground. Both of your hands are on your desk. And your paper is tilted slightly to the right, if you're right handed, to the left, if you're left handed. Elmanzo. Did not go to school that day. Period. I think we're turning this in for a grade. Let me double check. Nope, actually we're not. All right, next sentence. He did not have to go to school when there were more important things to do. He did not have to go to school when there were more important things 
to do. Okay, I'm going to stop there. You're going to continue on and finish the rest of that paragraph. He carried the little yoke into the barn and father went with him. Almanzo thought if he handled the calves perfectly, perhaps father might let him help with the colts next year. You have two more sentences to write. Go ahead and complete that. You can go into your bright thinker and right after the video, there you'll find a copy of the chapter. And in that chapter, I am going to highlight the paragraph that you need to write in cursive. You guys have a great day. I'll be back tomorrow with chapter six. Bye-bye.